Hello, everyone. Um, welcome to the uh, Northfield Auth Author and Artist Festival and our panel on blogging. Um, and uh, my name is Leo Huang, and I'm really excited to uh, be hosting two fabulous friends of mine. Uh, um, unfortunately, Holly Harden is not able to visit us uh, today, and so. Uh, but we do have David Dalt and Julia Sibley um, Jones, and uh, uh, I'm so excited to have them here with us. Um, uh, I uh, had their bios up and they just disappeared, and so I'll <laughs> have to return to that uh, shortly. Um, but I wonder if, uh, you know, I thought we could start out with a little bit of a, um, introductory uh, uh, sharing of, of some, some thoughts about uh, blogging and nature, and then we'll have some questions. Um, and, uh, and then we'll open up uh, questions from the audience if, if you have any, uh, anything that you would like to ask us. Um, so uh, Julia, do, would you like to start us off and uh, introduce yourself and share some thoughts? Yeah. Sure. Hi. Thank you, Leo. It's nice to be with you all. Um, I, my name is Julia Sibley Jones. I live in Greenville, South Carolina, and I, um, I work with a nonprofit doing development work, and I have two small children and a husband, and they're all trying to talk to me right now. <laughs> so I'm trying to tell them not to. And that's, I think, what my blog is about a lot of. It's like real life, and how do you encounter real life? And for me, a lot of what I'm trying to do is like and where is God in all that? What am I called to do in this messy right now place? And so um, one of the things that the, I know that the um, theme of this whole conference and the one going into leading into February is about honoring nature. And I feel like that's something I've always um, been interested in and how to do that. And so I did think a little bit about how does that uh, relate to my blogging? And I think, um, so I was thinking, so I graduated from college with a double major. So a major means you have about 30 hours in one topic. And I had a major in religion and I had another major in philosophy. And then in addition to that, I had about 26 hours of science of various kinds because those were always really integral to me. And one of my key experiences was spending, um, uh, being a participant in the college's um, island ecology program which is spending half a summer on a barrier island off the coast of Savannah, Georgia. And so we had, there were four science professors and nine fellow sciencey people and me <laughs> with philosophy and religion. And so it kind of, we had to run an experiment every week and write it up as an experimental design. And so every week, uh, uh, every week, my um, grades looked like this. Results section needs some work, great discussion, B plus. And so, um, I just was never always good at the like putting the data into the thing, but I could always talk about it and like how it related. And then in graduate school, I wrote my thesis on how different Christian denominations were beginning to speak or not about stewardship of the earth um, and how that's a Christian ethical concern. And this was in the early 1990s and it wasn't really a thing yet. So I was doing it a lot as just an independent study. So I feel like I've always been interested in the intersections of these three disciplines of philosophy, religion, and the natural world, and how best to use the first two in order to honor the third. So that's how I came to this place of blogging and to this panel in particular. Wonderful, thank you, Julia. Um, I love the idea of this uh, philosopher scientist. Uh, you know, I've always felt like uh, scientists need the, the humanists to join with them out into uh, to be able to convey what's happening and describe the, the world around us. Um, David, would you like a turn to uh, introduce yourself and, and uh, share some thoughts? Sure. Uh, hello, everybody. My name is David Dalt. I am currently assistant professor of Christian spirituality at Loyola University Chicago, and I also host a weekly radio show about religion and culture called Things Not Seen. And uh, I, I uh, have been thinking about um, this question of the natural and the natural world with regard to uh, kind of 
what we are when we're on social media uh, as, a, as a sort of preparation for this conference. And so I'll talk a little bit about that. Um, I picked up blogging because I wanted to write and because uh, I didn't know how to get published. And so I have picked up and laid down blogs the way one would pick up or lay down doing scales on a piano or, uh, or any other sort of preparatory exercise. And so both blogging and uh, sort of longer form social media like Facebook or Twitter threads, those have all been ways of kind of generating ideas in real time and getting as much feedback as possible. And as I have advanced in my career, uh, such as it is, uh, I've been able to uh, take those ideas that are kind of generated very quickly and with a lot of kind of feedback and real time participation, and then take that as almost a first draft or a proto first draft and move it into a range of of trying to get it more polished. But for me, uh, one of the reasons why I really like blogging, one of the reasons why I really like other types of uh, kind of immediate social interaction, uh, even if it's distanced social interaction over things like media. The reasons why I like that is because I never really trust my own ideas. Uh, I am a very harsh critic of my own thoughts. And so actually being able to see people responding in real time and see the things that uh, really resonate with people and the things that people really want to push back against helps me to feel less, uh, less self-critical. And it gives me an ability to, uh, to feel more confident when I'm actually trying to turn those things around into a more formal or a more academic publishing setting. But this all leads me to this question of kind of the natural with regard to what we're doing here. And I, I didn't think about this when I first started blogging, but as I've been reflecting on it and reflecting on the kinds of media I create, uh, I've come more and more to a really weird thing that the screenwriter Aaron Sorkin said in an interview a few years ago that has just stuck with me. And what Sorkin said is, you know, unlike people, sort of natural people, real people. When Sorkin writes a character on a page, he doesn't imagine the character having a backstory and he doesn't expect the actor to think of the character having a backstory. The character comes into existence when you first see the character on the screen and the character leaves existence as soon as the teleplay or the movie stops. And to me, that was profound because I started to think about what does that mean in terms of who I am when I'm relating to other people in these short media flashes. And what I came to realize is that to most of the people in my life, most of the people that I interact with in social realms like social media or blogging, I'm not a person, I'm a character. And so I've been thinking a lot about what it means to think of myself as a person that has a beginning, a middle, and an end versus the ways that all the people that experience me in these various realms experiencing experience me. And what I realize is that they experience me very differently than I experience myself. And so that to me really raises an interesting question about what we might call nature, uh, where we think nature is, where we think the natural world is, uh, especially as we are going about these kinds of interactions in something like a pandemic, where most of our interactions literally have a point where the camera's not on and then suddenly it's on and you see me. And then when the camera's done, I no longer exist for you in that kind of mediated realm. Like I'm much more a character right now to most of you than a person. And I think that that's interesting to talk about. And I think that that's worth kind of meditating on. And so that's kind of where I'm at as a preliminary for this conversation. Hmm. Thanks. That's fascinating. Uh, I, I used to think of my, uh, t explain teaching very much in that way that uh, whenever I was teaching, I was uh, embodying a character, a role, um, and a persona, and, and uh, that teaching was very much like acting, that you're, you're doing a performance. And um, so thank you, David. Um, what, uh, I also made a, a short piece. What, what I did was a, almost like a first draft of a blog so, so post. So it, it works with your idea of dra using blogs as drafts uh, of writing. Um, so you'll probably see this appear sometime in the near future. Uh, what does honoring nature look like? There was the summer I traveled to Ireland for, uh, and every weekend I hitchhiked around the countryside with my backpack. I didn't have a tent, but I did have a tarp and I set up under my sleeping bag, uh, that I set up under my sleeping bag on, under the stars on clear nights. And when it rained, I rolled myself inside like a burrito. I had a small candle lantern for light. So for the most part, when the sun went down, I went to sleep. When the sun rose, I woke to start my day. 
I tended to stay in the countryside where I could find a field to spend the night in, though I did find a few miserable urban shelters when I didn't opt for a hostel. I think of this time as when I was most physically in tune with the planet, my circadian rhythms at one with my surroundings. I moved from landscape to landscape, primarily by bipedal locomotion. I carried a bottle of orange drink and ate mostly cheese and bread. Uh, but I think we can also find moments of connection to nature in unexpected ways, like seeing an eagle flying overhead while driving into Cheapside and Greenfield, or in the creak of the soon to collapse tree strung up with vines just a little ways off the driveway. Or maybe it's in the way the wind blows and leans against the house like a dear friend. It seems honoring nature has more to do with notebooks and pens and less to do with phones and digital images, even as we all seek to capture the moment with a video or picture. There's something insufficient in two dimensions, the limitations of aperture, the absence of sound or smell, the temperature and the touch of leaves and spider webs. Most of the time, I imagine honoring nature as a solitary thing, but I think some of the most deeply felt moments in nature have been with a friend or partner who is able to honor also honor nature, to slow down and sit silently, to let it all soak into one's soul the way smoke permeates one's clothes until your very skin is smeared with and tastes like nature. All right. Um, so uh, I think the other panelists can come on the screen and we're gonna um, have a prompts, but our hope is also that this becomes a, uh, a conversation as well. Um, so that uh, we can go back and forth. Um, one of the things that I definitely saw uh, out of both of you and, and also Holly's uh, blog and, and to, a, to a lesser different kind of degree that this element of spirituality. So I definitely wanna come back to that at some point. Um, uh, I, I think uh, David definitely talked a little bit about this, but I, I wonder about uh, how did you, or why did you start blogging? And, and uh, I think David was a great, jumping off point and um, Julia, you have some thoughts that you might want to add to that? Mm -hmm. Sure. Um, I started uh, in a roundabout way, as I think a lot of people did. Um, we moved from Columbia, South Carolina to Greenville, South Carolina in 2011 for my husband to start a new job teaching. And um, it was like a tar terrible housing market. So we couldn't sell our house there. And anyway, we ended up um, sort of house sitting for some friends whose father had died and the mother just went into a memory care unit and they didn't know what to do with the house. And so we thought this was a nice temporary solution for a few months and it ended up being three years. Um, and I had a, a very busy husband who was very involved elsewhere and a three-year-old and a big dog with a waggy tail. And we moved into this house that I called my wacky grandma house, even though it was somebody else's grandma. And they, there was like stuff everywhere and it was all breakable. And the people that our friends were like, just live there, do whatever you want. And so I ended up um, packing all their stuff away so that my um, dependents would not break them. And, um, and, you know, cataloging it. And I was very thorough. I, had, I finally had my data and results down, but too late. But I packed it all away. And, I, and in the course of that, um, talking about character, Mrs. Lynn, who was the woman who was in the memory care unit and whom I never met, uh, became this real character for me, like a presence because I was living in her house and all of her family pictures were on the wall. But I was also going through her files and putting away her, the presents her grandchildren had given her. So she became this um, real figure for me. And I was missing my mom who had died a few years earlier. And even though we had moved back home, my dad, who was uh, wonderful and uh, supportive and generous was not like a hands-on kind of granddad. <laughs> so um, I had no break. I had this three-year-old and a dog the whole time. And so I started talking to her. <laughs> I started talking to Miss Lynn and eventually I wrote letters to her that I never sent, just letters to me. And what I realized was that catharsis of writing it out and asking the questions and talking about sorrow. And then for me also really the fact of like, okay, God, here's where I am and it's seemingly endless. And what are you calling me to do other than be here for this small child, this small relentless child? <laughs> like what else are you calling me to? Cause I feel like there's more. 
And so trying to write through some of that was how I started my blog, which was a bad time because actually we didn't have internet, which is a really not a great time to be um, starting an online presence. But I, a friend of mine in Columbia kind of set it up for me and he said, tell me what the blog's about. Is it like political or are you doing like recipes? And I was like, is there a, like my random life category? <laughs> and he said, we'll just leave it blank. We'll just leave it blank for now. So I really just still don't really know what the blog is about except that it's me in my messy right now uncharted place trying to grapple with that and trying to understand the deeper meaning that is always there but that we very seldom really take the time to investigate wow that that's beautiful i i love this idea that you're writing letters to this person that you you never never sent and and that you never met that, that's astounding yeah, I actually wrote a whole book. <laughs> I put it together as a book, actually, but it's a bad book. <laughs> wow, that that sounds like a phenomenal epistolary <laughs> book to me. Uh, uh, Maybe I just need a good editor. <laughs> <laughs> hey, David, uh, so uh, do you have any other thoughts you want to add about when you were starting your blog? Well, yeah, and I, I think that Julia has hit on something that is important and might be of use to the audience listening, and that is what to write about. And as a person who has worked in several different types of media, what I discovered along the way was the kind of open-endedness that Julie is talking about, like she doesn't really know what her blog is about. I discovered that that was actually an idea killer for me. And whenever I am thinking about a project, I try and lean into the smallest deliverable space as possible. And just to give you an example, I mentioned that I do a, a weekly radio show. It's an hour long radio show, but I never think about that. I think about it as chunks of seven minutes, seven minutes, 10 minutes, 10 minutes, 10 minutes, 10 minutes. And, and so I never have to talk to someone, even if I'm talking to the guests the entire hour, I never have to talk to them more than 10 minutes at a time. And that's actually really helpful for me in terms of chunking down kind of where I need to get to in the conversation. And writing is a very similar thing for me. I get very overwhelmed by the possibilities and the openness of subject matter. And so the more that I can say this particular particular writing task is about this. And so if it's a years ago, I started out with a blog that was kind of like what Julia said, it was it was anything goes. And there was niceness to that. But I have found over time that the more that I'm able to focus a particular channel down, this particular blog is going to be about creativity. This particular blog is going to be about trauma informed teaching this particular any way that I can chunk that down to a smaller bite size is helpful for me but the other wonderful thing is that even though Julia has kind of an anything goes blog she if I heard her correctly she really has a very clear sense of who she's writing to and I never knew that about her blog this uncharted now which is wonderful and if you haven't subscribed to it everybody listening should go and subscribe to this uncharted now because it's 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 really really great reflections that weave together daily life and spirituality and all that that julia does but i never knew that she was writing to that specific audience and to me that opens things up it's like i i i can see exactly how you can write about anything if you know who you're writing to mm -hmm. and so that's another way of getting at the same problem that i'm saying i chunk it down with time she chunked it down with audience but to me in terms of structure that's really helpful hmm. i i love that that, that creating some kind of structure. And, and in some ways, I think the blogging form itself it has a structure to it that, that's different than um, writing an editorial or an essay or something like that, that that's really interesting to play with. Um, uh, I remember reading about a, um, a writer for the New York Times who used to have a, a technology column. Um, and so he had a blog, uh, a weekly technology column in the New York Times and uh, he was uh, often a guest speaker at technology conferences and then wrote books and he talked about um, using a, a voice to text technology where he would just walk around his room all day long speaking everything that came into his mind and then at the end of the day he would do what you're talking about David and just sort of like okay that paragraph goes for my blog that paragraph goes for uh, the column in the New York Times and that paragraph, uh, I'll use that for a speaking engagement. And it was fascinating that he was able to be productive in that way that um, seemed so daunting on the outside. And for him, just was sort of stream of consciousness. Yeah. Um, uh, so I, I mentioned this at the beginning and I wonder 
what's the role of faith and spirituality and religion in your blogs? And 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 I guess um, you know I'll start with the, the idea that uh, I've always thought of myself as a spiritual person, um, and uh, even if I didn't necessarily embrace uh, um, a formalized religion uh, outside of my childhood. Um, but when I'm blogging, I seem to return to spiritual kinds of uh, themes often. And um, I'll return to, uh, you know, the more literal from my own childhood and, and going to church and, and things like that. But also just uh, when I think about how I um, conceive of the world, I, I think that sense of spirituality often is a reoccurring theme in my blog. And um, do, do you two have any thoughts you want to jump in with? I wonder, first of all, if you could, when you say spirituality, can you flesh out a little bit about what you mean by that word? Hmm. Um, I think part of it is stepping outside of my, or, Using, I, I like what Julia was saying about like, she's writing about her own current situation, her life, but then using that as a way to look at something bigger, right? And so um, I'll often start about, you know, writing about, you know, what I'm cooking that night or, um, you know, something that happened at, at work or uh, something I witnessed day or a memory. And then that memory becomes a metaphor for something bigger about um, how we treat each other as human beings or, or how the things that we value in life. Uh, um, and, and I think, uh, I guess when I think of spirituality, I, I think of that aspect of being able to um, think bigger than oneself in some way. Uh, uh, I, don't, I don't know if that makes sense, but Maybe my thoughts will form more after I hear you guys talk. <laughs> yeah, I completely relate to that. Um, I often do the same thing of I, I post once a month, which is uh, plenty for what I can handle right now. And I had to really kind of force myself to really to some accountability of at some point I just said, I'm going to post on the 15th. And it's not going to be perfect because if I try to make it perfect, then I don't post. And, so, and, and I will use any other excuse because writing is so hard. And so, you know, the laundry actually really does need to be done tonight. And so I had to use the accountability of a, um, a due date. And I do have subscribers to the blog. So it's helpful to know that people are, you know, maybe somebody would notice. <laughs> so, um, but yes, yeah, so I often start with some event or some thing or some noticing um, of, you know, the little, uh, the little blue tailed skink that I saw and the importance of it. And I, nature really does factor in a lot. And I think I really, um, I just see God in all of it. And so some of it is the um, speaking to people who don't <laughs> like how can you not see God in that it's so amazing and so but trying to do it instead of being kind of in an airy fairy way because I do live in South Carolina and there's not a lot of it, which is a interesting um it's interesting because southerners are very place oriented we are very like the land and the place and where you're from and so people often have a lot of noticing details about their specific environment and I think I just sort of try to take that as a way of yeah and I think God has a lot to do with that and um, I love what Father Richard Rohr who's a Franciscan um, says about it's not pantheism meaning there's a God in everything it's panentheism meaning there is God the God is in everything and every leaf and blade of grass and Katie did and and human and trying to I think in my blog, I'm trying to say, yes, the specific locale of place, but also the specific locale of 51 year old with two small children and a full time job. And so that place also and how that's relevant all up and down the scale of um, it matters. Your connections matter. Your your uh, the way you are in the world matters. And all of that is 
God speaking through your life. And I, I really like I really like what Julia just said about all of the different ways that you can try and uh, avoid writing. Uh, and and for me, in part, uh, that's also how I feel about praying. Um, because I, I oftentimes, so I'm, I, because I'm a professor of spirituality, I'm supposed to be sort of involving myself in formal prayer. And I find that that's one of the hardest things to do. I will find anything to do instead of, instead of doing that. And so I've been very, I've been very heartened by people like uh, Julia mentioned, Father Richard Rohr, people who will say that there is God in everything. And that's helpful to me. Um, I, uh, I am, I'm also thinking about kind of what Leo, you just said about spirituality kind of taking you outside of the known into the unknown. And it's interesting to me because most of my life I have described myself, particularly when I, I was raised an atheist. And so when I became part of formal religion, I was really a stranger to formal religion. And so most of my life I have described myself as religious, but not spiritual, sort of the inversion of spiritual, but not religious. <laughs> And, and part of what I am doing when I'm writing is not trying to get at the, ineffab the ineffability of the supernatural, but rather the ineffability of my own emotional life. Uh, a good deal of my life was spent not like, uh, and folks, uh, both Leo and Julia in this conversation have known me since my college years. And in my college years, if you had asked me, David, what are you thinking? What do you, I could answer that question very easily. But if you asked me, David, what are you feeling? Uh, it was a jumbled mess. And so learning to connect words to emotions has been really my adult project. And as I move closer to that possibility, as I move closer to the ability for my words to connect up with feelings, that's really been the terra incognita, the unknown realm for me. Uh, I, academically, I've been swimming in kind of spiritual questions and theological questions and philosophical questions for most of my life. And intellectually, that's very comfortable. But how do I feel about God? How do I feel about the people that I love? How do I feel about what I'm eating, this broccoli? That's harder to say. And that's really where I want to be locating a lot of my writing is trying to uh, convey a really solid emotion so that the so that uh, I think Stephen King talks about it like mental telepathy. So that when I finally figured out figured out what it is that I'm feeling, I can somehow convey that to you in a way that you feel it at least for a, for a moment, uh, even if it's a subtle emotion. And and the 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 times when I'm most pleased with my writing is when someone uh, when someone writes back in response as a comment and says, "Why wow, I really felt that." And that to me is like the the real mark that I'm trying to get to. So I don't know how to talk about spiritual stuff. For me, emotion are more than enough to try and spend a lifetime trying to get my words around. And that's, but, but that being said, those who grew up in more stable households than I did, who have more connection to their emotions, I'm very, very pleased when they, when, as you've said, Leo, when you're trying to use your words to speak to something more ethereal and metaphysical, uh, that I think is very valid work. It's just not work that I'm yet feeling equipped to do. Mm -hmm. Beautifully said. I, I I think um, my wife would probably uh, argue that I'm not very good at talking about my feelings either. It, it's probably much easier for me in writing than to actually explain how I'm feeling about the broccoli. Uh, <laughs> but I, I also really like how you've talked about the, the blog as giving you feedback. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I was actually just um, part of my job. I'm, I'm the... Uh, currently the Dean of Humanities, Engineering, Math and Science at a community college. And part of my work is to go into these classes and do observations. And, uh, and when you're online, a lot of that's poking around in an online class and seeing what's going on. Um, and this one professor did a, a session on social media and its impact on health and, and identity. And, um, and so they were talking about selfies and the students were writing little posts about like, why do they post selfies and what happens to their uh, sense of self when they see people react to it? Um, and and it, that, that's funny to think about a blog post as sort of like the 50 plus or, or uh, version of a selfie of like wanting to get some kind of affirmation of someone saying like, yes, I feel what you're talking about, you know, and, and that is sort of rewarding when someone responds. Um, uh, to the blog and says like, oh, that was something special for me. You know? uh, so very nice. Um, at one point, I thought I was going to be a priest. Uh, 
uh, th this was more in my childhood. So uh, um, and I was raised uh, Catholic and uh, in a Korean Catholic community and, um, and for a period of my childhood, I thought that that's what I wanted to be. Uh, and, and so it was um, as I hit puberty and beyond that I sort of broke away and went in a different direction. And <laughs> became unredeemable to a certain extent. <laughs> uh, so uh, I, I'm wondering if you all would, would talk a little bit about your blogging voice and it, uh, how that's different than your ordinarily ordinary written voice or your in-person persona. And, and again, David, you talked a bit about that when, when we started. And I'm wondering about if you want to talk a little bit more about that persona and, and who you are as a blogger versus uh, who you are as David uh, in your house. Sure. So uh, I, I will say that uh, in terms of my blogging voice, uh, I, I have a couple of authors, essayists mainly, that uh, have been very influential on me in, uh, in the, the course of my life and in the course of my thinking. Probably the, the strongest influence was a fellow by the name of Milton Samuel Mayer, who was a writer for the Progressive magazine in the 1950s through the 1980s. And uh, when, I, when I sit down to write, uh, particularly when I'm trying to write about an, an issue that has uh, a, a sort of gesture towards a moral or an ethical outcome, I find that what I'm really trying to track to is I want to sound like Milton Mayer. You know, or or I want to sound like, or if I'm going to write about spirituality, I want to write with some of the kind of folksiness and accessibility of somebody like J.D. Salinger and Franny and Zoe, like where you you really kind of get the everydayness and the etherealness of this. And so for me, uh, I don't I don't think that Dalt me has a voice. I think that what I'm doing constantly is cribbing other people's voices. And uh, there's a, a really good musician by the name of Peter Gabriel. And years ago, he said something about creativity that has stuck with me. He says, when you, when you hear something that you like, do your best to copy it and inevitably you will get it wrong and that error will be interesting. And that will be the closest thing to originality you'll ever hit. And to me, oftentimes when I'm writing, that's exactly where I'm at. I'm trying to copy somebody else's voice and take on a subject. I stumble, and in the stumbling, I, I land, and in landing, I see the toadstool, and I'm like, oh, that's interesting. Let's talk about that. So to me, it's, it's all about uh, tr uh, trying to copy somebody else and be accidental because I don't really know how to be original. Uh, and that's the best I got in terms of how I do this a lot of times. Oh, I love that. I love that, that error as originality. That's beautiful. Uh. Yeah, I do Julia? too. I really like that too. And I think that is the part where it's like, where the you, <laughs> where the God in you is showing up as a witness. And I, um, I definitely, I don't really, um, I love uh, Anne Lamott and her writings and her um, take on faith because it just feels so raw and honest and, um, it's sort of the opposite of the selfie or it's the like in your face, I'm showing you my real messy life selfie instead of the posed one. And that was so attractive to me when I started reading her and even more so when I became a mother and you know, God, there's just this whole like, there's a thousand million ways to do it wrong and just not really very many ways of doing it right. But everybody's just showing you the times they're doing it right. And it's really hard. So I loved her honesty. And that is one thing that I really go for, aim for in, in my blogs is not polishing it so much that it's no longer real. Um, and uh, so for me, like David talked about, you know, somebody come in and say, I really felt that one for me is when I've told some story of something happening and somebody will say, I'm so sorry you're going through that. And I can say, well, actually, that was a year and a half ago, but thank you, because that means it came really, you know, the immediacy came through. I didn't say I actually was going through it now. It just said, so that's really helpful. And then the other writer whom I love is uh, Annie Dillard. And that's the sort of nature connection of like, I wish I, you know, I often wish I had a better or deeper um, knowledge of science. Uh, I have a real armchair scientist view and I, you know, I love reading about physics. I don't really understand the math. <laughs> I really love reading people who can explain it. And I, I do, if I 
do go find that blue tailed skink, then I do kind of Google it and find that it's Plesiodon fasciatus. And I really like that. But I, so I know a little bit about a lot of things, but her, Annie Dillard's uh, way of writing about something is focusing on something and focusing in more and focusing in more. And then, as you said earlier, Leo, kind of projecting that into what does that mean metaphysically? <laughs> what does that mean metaphorically? What does that mean in a larger sense? And so those are the kinds of things I try to do in wrapping that all in and then trying to, to bring it back to, to me in this place, in this moment, in this world. Julia, I, I've got a question about that. So would you just would you describe the style that you're working towards in your writing as kind of event reflection event reflection like you're giving uh, uh, an event and then you're stepping back and you're saying and here's what it means and then you're stepping back into it? Or is there a different structure that you're working for here? Uh, when you say working for, <laughs> I think you're giving me a lot of credit for what I'm doing. I think that really month to month, I'm just sort of winging it. Um, but I do think that I've been doing it long enough that it does feel like there's kind of an arc to my writing now and that it usually I start with something and it usually comes back around at the end and I try to weave it through a little bit. Um, so it's not really, it can start in any one of those places. Um, I'm not a musician, I know you are, but I don't know if you ever start, like sometimes there are words and you find the music for it and sometimes there's a the music and find the words for it. And I feel like that's my blog a lot of times of whatever it is this month. And then I'm trying to, wow, do I have any memory of something that seems relevant to that. And I do keep a little uh, list of either just quotations or, uh, you know, a, a witty phrase that I come up with that doesn't work for this blog, but might for some other or just some something my child says that's really cool and doesn't quite work. And so I try to use that sometimes when I'm stumped to, to bring it because, I, you know, nothing nothing's ever wasted I think is part of and I think that's a very like honoring nature kind of thing too is that all of these cycles of the um, all the systems of the cycles and really at a large view nothing's wasted mm. I, I love that nothing being wasted that's like uh one of my kids, uh, childhood friends, her, her parents have, have gotten really into uh, self-sufficient farming and mm -hmm. uh, and and raising animals and and you know uh, and, and harvesting and slaughtering the animals and and they've shared pictures on social media and like wow I don't know if I could do that uh, and and her response has been that well we make use of every part of the animal and nothing goes to waste and. It's an uh, amazing thing to think about our own, everything that we do in that way, yeah. Um, uh, so we have more questions, but I also uh, wanna let people know that if you use your raise your hand function, you can ask us questions and join in. Um, and Lisa who's in the background is gonna help manage those. Um, so if you do have a question, uh, feel free to use the raise the hand function. Uh, we are recording this session and so um, if, uh, if you have a shyness about being, uh, having your voice on audio, you can use the chat, um, or refrain, yeah. um, or, or not use the chat. Um, <laughs> uh, let's see. Oh, uh, thinking of voices, uh, you know, it's funny because there was a, uh, a really famous columnist for the, the Boston Globe who I loved, um, and I, I'm blanking on his name right now, and I feel terrible about it. Um, but uh, he, he got busted for, for making up his columns, which was a real, uh, it, 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 was, it was like a loss of faith for me because I had used him in my classes. I had, uh, um, you know, I had held him up as the pinnacle of awesome columnist writing. Um, and the main thing about it was that he wrote about regular life. He would go out in, into, um, the streets and talk to someone on the street and and use that as a way to talk about what's happening in our country um, and to find out that he was actually making it up some of the time and didn't actually talk to these people and was was writing fiction which was also kind of beautiful but disappointing <laughs> uh, so so I, I, I aspire I suppose in, in my voice to, to have some of that and um, I also uh, have been doing uh, economic development work um, and there's this idea of asset-based community development and it comes out of uh, these scholars in Chicago, Kurtzman and McKnight. Um, 
and this idea that if you work from your assets, that gives you something to build uh, because we're always focused on deficits that puts us in these binds where you can't, can't do things if you're just focused on the deficits because you don't, you have all these lacks. And so with my blog, I try and focus on things that you can build with. Uh, and and it's, it would be easy for me at the end of the day when I start working on my blog to write about all the problems and frustrations I have or that, are, that I see in the world. Um, but then I have nothing to give to my readers. And so I, I try and keep things more on the asset based or more on the positive side um, as sort of, that's part of my voice and part of my duty with my, my blog, and even if I'm having a rough day. Um, um, so uh, David talked about you, Julia, knowing a, a vision of who's reading your blog. And, and I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit more about that, like your audience and, and who you, you envision being that reader. Sure. I. Um... I sometimes know kind of who's re reading my blog because I do have a subscription. And so I know a lot of the people kind of get it and read it, which is fantastic. Thank you to all those people, if any of you are out there. Um, I think sometimes that I also um, put it on my Facebook and I think people get it from there. It's kind of the only reason I still have Facebook because so that's how a lot of people find it and want to get it that way. They don't want one more email. So, and I think it gets forwarded you know, to other people sometimes. For me, it's always interesting to hear, I don't get a whole lot of comments generally from any particular month. So it's always interesting. And I always, I, I never, I just, I never like them. <laughs> you know, when I post them, I always think, why did I just do that? Do you know Brene Brown who talks about vulnerability and shame? And I love that she talked about having her TED talk and then having this um, vulnerability hangover. And I feel that every month I post it and think, why did I just do that? Why would I just throw that? Because they're very personal. Why would I just throw that out there? So, um, so I don't ever like them right away. And then it's always interesting to me who does contact me and say, that's like exactly what I needed to hear. Or I had a similar expression, or I really liked the way you said that. And I think, and it's never the same and it's not generally who I would have expected. So that's always kind of affirming and interesting too. Um, I can tell I'm like my Google analytics how like how many times they've been so I try not to go down that too much because that's crazy making but I will tell you that I wrote um so one of our senators is Lindsey Graham who I uh have my differences of opinions with um and during the whole Brett Kavanaugh fiasco he um in the middle of all that said something about um so like who's being the sex whore drunk now <laughs> remember that but I was outraged and so I wrote about that um, and I titled it that. And so um, that's a whole longer different story, but I was kind of going with, it's always interesting to look and like at three in the morning, my time, that's the one that has a lot of hits from, you know, like Dubai or wherever there's people around the world who have, you know, Google searched those things. And I was like, wow, they were really disappointed <laughs> when they came across my blog. So anyway, I think that was a little further afield, but that's my answer. I guess that's an excellent tip for people who want readers for your, your blog. <laughs> right. right. Uh, how about you, David? Do you have a well, sense of who's reading your blog? Well, that, so, so as I said earlier, uh, one blog is kind of a misnomer for me. I, I, tend to, I tend to move around in a lot of different spaces. And so I have, I have been blessed to have some opportunities to write for regular publications, but also I have I have kind of different channels where I tend to put different sets of ideas. And uh, I, like Julia said, uh, it really is a rabbit hole to fall down um, in terms of kind of who's reading when. And this is true also for the podcasting that I do. The numbers can become very important for things like advertising. But that tends to be not what you're, if you end up writing for the numbers, or if you end up producing for the numbers, that can create a, a, a feedback loop that for me is very toxic, because I end up trying to write towards something going viral or produce towards something going viral. And then the enjoyment of why I do it kind of withers away. Uh, and, and this notion of virality, this notion of, uh, you know, 
Julia just you you mentioned that that you had a certain title and that caused people to kind of flock to it. One of the things that I've learned about virality is virality is one of those natural lightning strikes that happens if you just keep showing up. And it's not really something that you can control or control for. And the more that you try and chase it, uh, one, the more crazy making it is, but also probably the less likely it is that you're to hit it. The, the, I, I, I do a lot of, of material posting into the world. I create a, a couple hours a week of audio. I create about 2000 words or more of writing that goes into the world every week. And uh, what I've discovered is, you know, most of that doesn't rise above the noise floor. It's just part of the, the buzz that everybody's interacting with. Every once in a while, something will hit, but it's, it's been maybe once or twice in my life that that has happened. Uh, after 15 years or so of kind of doing this on a pretty consistent basis. So if what you're chasing is that kind of explosive connection again and again, you're going to be very disappointed. If you're, if you're writing for the writing, if you're writing for the quality of writing, if you're writing for the connection, uh, if you're writing f because you enjoy, as Julia said, this kind of imaginative audience of this, of this woman whose house you're occupying, like all of those can be really, really good reasons to write. Uh, virality and click click-throughs are probably the worst reason to write, but everybody wants the virality and the click-throughs. Me too. And so, <laughs> so it's, it's this weird dance that we do. But for, on my, in my saner times, in my better days, I recognize that it's more about the craft and less about the clicks, but everybody likes clicks. Yeah. Uh, I've always been impressed with your um, prolific nature, David, and just, just uh, you know, in all the different formats that you're engaged in, it's really impressive and, and something uh, uh, I strive for someday. Yeah. You're, you're, you're kind, but actually that, that makes me kind of, I, I come to that because I, I feel so much of a fake most of the time. I'm trying to prove to the world that I'm actually worth the, the things I'm doing. But for people like you, Leo, who have real jobs and Julia, who have real jobs, I'm wondering about the question of balance and how you, how you find creative time versus uh, the time when you actually have responsibilities. Like what, what do you do to keep that balance sane? I'm really curious about that. Both of you. Um, I, I, I think of, uh, I, I need some of that balance in order to do the work that I do, I think. And, and, uh, and so I try to structure it into my days um, more for my own sanity and well-being, sort of like uh, self-care than for producing something out in the world. And so that means uh, in the morning before I start work, while I'm uh, eating my breakfast, I try and work on a poem. Um, and that's usually uh, in a notebook with a, a pen. Um, and so I'll sit at the kitchen table and do that while drinking coffee and uh, eating my drinking my smoothie or whatever it is. And then at the end of work days, and it's funny, in my head, I, I, I portion it up for Monday through Thursday, because Friday, I don't want to do, do this, but uh, Monday through Thursday, after my work day, uh, I'll sit down and work on a blog post, because I need something to get out of everything that I've been doing all day for work, which is ironically also sitting in front of the computer, but uh, it, you know, it's a different headspace, and and so I'll listen to some music, and I'll um, uh, uh, shift to that mode of thinking. Um, how about you, Julia? Yeah, there's no balance. Yeah. <laughs> there's, <laughs> I mean, there's. I mean, um, yeah. I really, I honestly think the whole thing is just. A, I feel like we're. It's kind of. I. I. Uh, I call it spinning plates. It's just keeping all the plates spinning. And sometimes some need more, a little torque than others. And it depends and it changes. And when I've tried to like force it, into, I love the idea of your schedule, Leo. <laughs> that would work for me for like 25 minutes. And then somebody would, you know, break their arm. Or, I don't know. So uh, it, it's a lot of juggling. Um, I think one thing that the, the, the deadline that I post on the 15th has been really helpful for me. And it's been also, my family is supportive in theory and also in practice sometimes, but it is a way for me to say, I have to do this today or like tomorrow, hmm. honestly, because tomorrow's the 15th. And I was kind of hoping that this would generate some ideas for my next one, because that's how seat of the pants it is a lot of the time. Um, but just also trying to 
I, for my subscribers, I send out something at the end of the month, usually the last day of the month that just says like, here's what I'm thinking about. And uh, sometimes I get some reactions for that, but it's also a way for me to just sort of check in with myself halfway through the month. Like, what am I thinking about? I should start thinking about something, um, which gives me a little while, you know, on my walks or on my whatever to give it a little brain space. Um, so that's kind of a how I try to, it, it also helps me focus on something outside myself, you know, and because I think one of my gifts um, to give the world is this noticing um, but I'm also kind of shy about it. So I think the writing for me is a way to offer that gift that feels a little less threatening um, because I can craft it a little bit. I mean, part of the one of your questions is like, why, why do you blog? What's your voice? And part of the reason I blog is because I think I have something to say, but I'm really not confident about the way I'm saying it in any given, like now, for instance, <laughs> I'm not even answering your question, but it would be so much better if I wrote a paragraph about it. So I think that's kind of how I get to to the blogging and the gift of taking something that I feel like um, that I do offer the world. And I, what I would really love to do is like live by myself in a little hermitage <laughs> and notice things on my own. Um, but that is not the life that I've been given or that I've chosen. And what I've come to realize is all of that daily, like rubbing up against stuff like that's the grist for my mill. Like that's when I write about something, that's the stuff that resonates with people. It's not the pristine beauty of a really well defined thought. It's the like, how'd you do it in the moment with a dog and a, you know, an eight year old and a grant due tomorrow. Yeah, uh, I, I love that you send out that sort of in process email. Mm -hmm. You know, I feel like despite what you said, it makes it feel like that you're working on something all month long and that you know, right. we're getting a little glimpse of, of something. Um, uh, and and uh, Lise mentioned that Paul Richmond has a question for us. Is, is he still there and able to ask? Or? Yeah, I'm still here. Oh, uh, great. Hey, uh, two things. Uh, I just, uh, what, Leo, if you could um, say a little bit more about why you were so disappointed in that person's when you found out that they weren't totally true, because I'm thinking from what just Julia said, you know, you have your day and then you're, you're kind of telling a story. So was it that, you know, you thought it was true, but then you find out it's not, or, you know, that everyone else is thinking they're trying to do a truth. And the second thing is just that, I, I don't know if you've seen the stuff of bloggers are the ones who are selling the most books now because they've created their own audience. And I just, there was a New York Times article about, you know, picking a poet laureate and someone who went to the right MFA program and all this stuff. But the bloggers who put out said to all their subscribers, oh, I'm putting out my first two years and they're the one who sold 100,000 copies. So any thoughts on that about that you've, you've created an audience and people want to hear how you deal with the dog, Julie, or, you know what I mean? It's like they have a dog, they, you know, they, they know all the experiences. So it is something that you're tapping. Thanks for letting me ask those two things. I'm curious about each of your thoughts on those. Um, I think the first was one about um, is about the integrity of the the author, you know. And um, I think uh, I love fiction. I went to I, I did my MFA in fiction writing, and 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 I think you can learn a lot from fiction, and you can use fiction to create all kinds of um, you know, reflections on the world that we live in. Um, but I also feel like there's a difference between what's nonfiction and what's fiction and, and that um, in some ways, uh, someone who's writing about what's happening in their life or a column about what's happening in Boston on the streets of Boston, um, they're almost like uh, researchers. You know, and so they're, they're like social scientists going out into the world and uh, to fabricate your data in that way um, feels self-serving, you know, and, and um, like you're not doing the heavy lifting that needs to be done. If you can't go out into the world on your walk and think about your walk and instead you're just staying at home and pretending you went out on a walk, that, that, that feels... Um, feels like a violation of your readers. And, and so 
to, to me that that's what was the, the, the big thing there. Um, I forget what was the second half of your question. So if either of you two. I've, I've actually got something to say about the, what Paul was saying about kind of generating your own audience. The, the best example of, of me seeing that, not in myself, but in somebody else is in the author, Barbara Mahaney. She was a longtime columnist for the Chicago Tribune, but every morning she'd get up and she'd write morning pages on a little blog that, and so she ended up having kind of almost a couple, like 10,000 articles, and then has been now turning that into books. She had a platform at the Tribune. She had an audience that followed her. And so when she moved to book publishing, she kind of moved that audience naturally with her and has grown it. So if you've got the time and you've got the resources to do that, that's a way to do it. I have no idea how to do that, but I, but I, I, but I, but that's the most successful example I've seen of something like that. Well, do you either of you feel like you have an audience? I mean, Julie, you said you put out a book. So do you have a sense that you're no, your audience isn't running to rip it off the shelves? I said I wrote a book, <laughs> a really bad book that I have. Okay. Um, um, and actually, I do have a book proposal for a collection of blog so these essays, really. So I do. Um, and I would love to do that. You know, and I don't have that audience. I have a little audience. It feels like a great audience to me, but there's not, you know, that's where that numbers game is. Like it's not viral. And I feel like it's a weird little, it's a, uh, it feels like a very good niche that I'm in, but it's also a little bit of a small niche of, you know, the intersectionality of religion and nature and um, philosophy and everyday life. And so, yes, I think it would be widely, um, profitable for a lot of people if they read my stuff, but apparently publishers have not thought that yet. <laughs> but I would, you know, welcome anybody who wanted to dive deeper in that with me. If other folks out in the audience are listening, uh, I'm told that you need to kind of raise your hand or do your do your little, uh, the emoji of the hand raise, and then uh, the moderator will find a way for you to ask, ask your question. I sometimes forget that I have readers. Uh, and so uh, uh, I'll be talking to someone um, and because I wrote something last night, it'll be at the top of my head and, and I'll, I'll start explaining about this thing that I've been thinking of. And, and this person will say, well, yeah, I read your post yesterday. And I was like, oh, you did? Uh, well, ha, I guess I have nothing to say to you then. <laughs> I already uh, said all my thing, you know? And, and, uh, and so, so that's kind of funny. Um, but I, I've also, similar to Julia, thought like, it'd be great to turn all these into something, you know, and, and um, I like how David talked about it as like a first draft and like, maybe someday I'll go back and I'll weed through all these and try and pick out the best ones and flesh them out a little bit and turn them in, into something. Um, one of my kids, this was a couple of years ago, was uh, um, uh, going to Smith College to, um, get take Korean classes and so um, I'd wait for him while he was getting tutored and uh, and I kept picking up this book of essays uh, um, there were sort of like uh, humanist perspectives on on everything and and it, it was almost like a, a I wish I could pull the author's name is uh, I'll try and look for it but um, there are essays on everything from popular culture to history to and, and they felt almost like blog posts, each essay, and there, each essay was freestanding, but together was sort of a collection of um, humanity's perspectives on the world. And, and I thought that was wonderful. And uh, it, it would be great to have that kind of opportunity someday, or maybe the three of us could collaborate and come up with a collected volume. Uh, <laughs> yeah. uh, so let's see. Uh, so does, does writing um, a blog or, or writing in general uh, help feed nourish you in some way? I, um, I am always glad oh, wow. that I, <laughs> sorry? Oh. sorry, I am always glad that I have written something. Um, I, I really, the process is like, it's just hard for me. Writing's hard and it's a, a discipline of showing up and sitting down and just cranking through the just a bad first draft and 
I still have to, I have gotten to, you know, I used to write them and now I type them, but then I still have to print them and actually like physically mark them up and move them around. And, um, and then there's always that, like, you know, that vulnerability hangover of what did I just do? But then at some point I'm always like, I'm really glad I did that. Like, I'm glad I, especially if I get some feedback of like, wow, that was a really, that really touched me or that's how I was feeling too, or interesting. And I've tried, I think I've gotten, as I've felt clearer about my voice and what I'm saying in it, I feel like I've gotten braver about saying things too. And uh, talking about current events or what's happening or taking on Lindsey Graham or in this, um, in my past one in October, which felt right because it was right before the election, I talked about my, it was called affirmation of faith. And I talked about um, that I never say the Pledge of Allegiance because I don't have an allegiance to anything besides God. And if my church had asked me for a Pledge of Allegiance, then that's a cult. That's not a church. But what the church does have is these creedal statements or an affirmation. And I said, I think it might be more important if as a nation we asked in what do you believe and if we had an affirmation of faith for america could we start there like do you believe in democracy do you believe that this thing can work because if so then the conversation is very different than being polarized into there's them and there's us and if they say it then they're not us and we're right and they're wrong um that's not believing in democracy so if you believe in it then then we can have a starting point so i feel like i don't think i would have written that um, two years ago, certainly not four years ago, but I think that both the intensity of the year and of, you know, being older and at some point not caring <laughs> so much about, um, you know, I'm 51 for goodness sake. So, um, and also just a little more confident about my voice and writing that I feel like I've been able to take some of those leaps and be braver and then get some good response for it. So. Mm. I love that. Um, I, I didn't realize that we're we're just about out of time, and 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 so uh, this has been such a fantastic conversation. I I, I feel like we have another uh, week's worth of talking to to do, and and I, I'd love to engage in it that way. Um, but I wonder if uh, if we want to leave with any last thoughts that you might have. Um, uh, in, David, do you have, want to start us off with anything that you want to share before we say goodbye? Sure. Building on uh, kind of what Julia was just saying, uh, part of my trouble with writing is always feeling like the, the good words, the right words are elsewhere. And uh, I, I had a, a, I've, been, I've had a book that I've been working on for an academic press for a number of years now, and it's a 60,000 word contract, and I've written 240,000 words at this point. And the reason why is because every time I think that I'm getting close to the argument, uh, I suddenly realize, oh, this is crap, and the, the real words are elsewhere, and the better words are elsewhere. And I want to caution anybody that's thinking about doing this to not go down that route, <laughs> um, to, to, try, to try and do exactly what uh, Julia said, which is, these are the words I have right now. And I'm going to get them out there, and then I'm going to move on, and 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 hope that the next one maybe can be better in some ways, but not be so precious. And I, I'm I'm really trying to learn that, uh, and it, it it clearly it, it takes me some time to learn that in some projects. In other projects, it's gotten better, but uh, I think I think in the spirit of what Julia just said, uh, Steve Jobs once said that real artists actually get around to shipping things. And so that's, that's, the real, that's the real watchword for anyone who's wanting encouragement. Just find a way to start creating and getting it out, the, out into the world. Don't wait for it to be perfect, which is, Julia said it better a few minutes ago, but that, that to me is, is the, the thing I wanna leave people with is, is it's very important to get stuff out there, however you do it. Wonderful, thank you. Julia, do you have any last parting thing? Uh, just to echo what David said, I think that's really right. The other author that I really love who talks about that a lot of this is Seth Godin, who's an entrepreneur and talks a lot about uh, like bringing your best self to it and finding your niche and not having a race to the bottom um, and just ship it you know, when you feel like, you know, do the do as much as you can and then don't overthink it and ship it and then um, take the feedback and and do better the next time and build a dedicated audience that then wants to talk about your stuff and move it forward that way and that it's your you're banking on quality and your 
you're investing in the trust. So back to your Boston Globe guy, you're investing in the trust of somebody knowing that they have an integrity in your product, whatever it is, and then build on it as much as you can. Mm, wonderful, wonderful advice. Uh, it reminds me of a time in my life when and, uh, my kids were little and I was really stressed out and uh, I, I wasn't getting published anywhere. And so I would type these poems on my typewriter, um, take them to um, the, the copy store, get it, make a couple copies, and then I'd staple them around town uh, on, on like telephone poles and things like that. And, and then, uh, you know, I, I'd sit around and watch people waiting for the bus and reading the poem. And, and uh, if I, I caught one person reading a poem, I felt like, okay, that was great. You know, and, uh, so maybe a blog is, is sort of an evolution of that idea, this sort of guerrilla poetry. Well, uh, David and Julia, thank you so much. It's wonderful to have you uh, on here. And thank you, Lise and Paul and, and everyone in the, in the background there. Um, it's such a privilege to, to talk with you two. Uh, it's been years since we've had a, a, a real conversation like this. And, and, and uh, um, I, I feel lucky to uh, have, have been here with you. It's a, what a privilege. Um, and I also want to thank the authors and the artists uh, and uh, program that, that Lisa has been coordinating. Um, and this is part of the associated programming for that conference. And stay tuned for all kinds of other fantastic, wonderful uh, sessions and readings and, and presentations. All right.